morning. And a very warm welcome to everyone joining us at St. George's for Sunday worship today, both in church and at home. Today, we welcome student minister Christopher Watt. And next week, we will be celebrating harvest. So just a wee reminder, if you'd like to attend church next week, please remember to use the booking system. Telephone 01387 267 072 on the Wednesday immediately prior to the service between 10 and 11 in the morning and 6 and 7 at night. For those of you present in church today, please remember to remain seated at the end of the service until the duty deacons guide you safely from the sanctuary. Thank you. Let me just add my welcome to Christopher, who uh, began uh, his placement uh, on Monday and will be here with us until just after Easter. And he's just entering his uh, first year at uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands, is that right? Yes, yeah, so uh, he's got a bit of commuting to do between here and Dingwall, I think, where that is, or Inverness. But actually, he's doing it. He's doing it by distance learning, which is fantastic, uh, considering the current, uh, the current uh, crisis that we're in. So he'll be with us uh, uh, every week. Uh, more or less, until just after Easter. It's quite difficult because uh, normally I know you would be, you know, asking him lots of questions and getting to know him. Uh, you will be able to get to know him, but it may just take a wee bit longer because of all the social distancing uh, that we have uh, to observe. A warm welcome to everyone at home who uh, is watching either live right now or uh, after uh, 12 o'clock when the recording is available. Now, normally, I was, I've been having a think about this. Normally, one of, the, one of the strange things about church just now is the atmosphere in church um, when we're physically here because there are so few people scattered all over the place. And normally, the first thing we would do in church is welcome each other. But we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to shake hands and wander about the church. So I thought, how can we do that? Because that, that might just help us to relax a bit, particularly if it's your first time here. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to ask you to run around and hug everybody. That's not allowed. But what I thought we could do is just turn around and wave to the folks beside you and say, say hello. And that can perhaps be our welcome for the next wee while. And if you're watching at home, please feel free to wave at me on the television screen. It is wonderful that we can come to worship our God, even in the midst of a global pandemic. And I know that things uh, are not looking good at the moment. Um, so how much more important is it to come before God and to bring all of our cares and concerns, all of our burdens to God. Uh, we know that we can do that because God is always there for us. The foundation of our faith is, of course, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let us proclaim that as we worship God by the praise. Christ has made the sure foundation. And just please remember, if we can just remain seated and sing into yourself. Christ has made the sure foundation.
let us pray. Lord God, who sent his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, into the world to be the cornerstone of our faith, we lift up our praise to you as the source of all light and love, all knowledge and truth, all goodness and love. Help us now to lay aside our cares and concerns as we seek to worship you in this place where you have been worshipped down through the years by those who went before us. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we confess how far short we fall of your will and purpose for us. We acknowledge that we do not love as we should. That we sometimes use words that are too harsh. That we sometimes fail to act for good. That our thoughts and our motives are not always what they might be. And so, Lord, as we confess our sin to you, forgive us. And grant us your pardon and your peace. Lord, we thank you for calling us to follow you and for giving us a place and a part in the fellowship of your followers. And so make us ever faithful to that calling in our lives to follow Jesus. Help us to put our loyalty to you before all else. Save us from putting our trust in the material things that we possess, but rather make us good stewards of all you give to us and continue to supply all that we require as we seek to live out our faith day by day. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, in whose words we further pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. If uh, you are watching, uh, I hope you've had a good week uh, at school or at nursery, wherever you've been. Um, I'm going to uh, just bring a bag of stuff around the front because this, mo this morning I thought I would have myself a wee snack. So this morning I brought myself a bowl. I'll just turn around this way. And I also brought myself, I wonder if you can uh, guess what I'm going to eat. Here we are. I also brought myself a spoon. A napkin, of course, because I want to make sure that uh, I don't uh, I don't slaver down my shirt like I normally do. Is that right? Yeah, normally do that. Yeah, okay. I also brought um, a, a tray so that I made, just to make sure that I, uh, I, uh, I'm able to keep the place tidy. And I've also brought myself a pot. A tin of soup, because that's what I'm going to have. I'm going to have some soup. And I've also brought um, the bread to go with. The soup. Here we are. We've got a piece of bread out. Oh, fabulous. So we'll stick that onto the tray. There we are. And I'll just put the bag down here. And I'll just make my soup. And, uh, oh, lovely. So let me see. What all you do is you uh, carrot and butter bean soup. Lovely. Butter beans are very good for you. So is carrot. Good for your eyesight. Now, here we go. So nowadays, I don't even need a tin opener because it comes with a ring pull. So I simply open the tin of soup, it says here, place it into the, uh, into the pot. Oh, look at that, that's lovely. 
There we are. Take the lid on the pot. Oh dear. And then, um, wait a minute, what am I missing? A stove. I need a stove, don't I? Or a microwave. Hold on a wee sec. Anybody got a microwave? Anybody bring a microwave with them this morning? No, no microwaves. Oh dear. I wonder, what do you think? Think I should? There we are. Anybody like to try it? Let's have a wee go at this. Oh, it's absolutely disgusting. It's disgusting because actually I kind of missed the most important thing, didn't I? I missed the fact that I need some sort of power source in order to heat the soup. Cold soup is just, oh, it's absolutely awful. So I brought everything I needed, even, even this, but I didn't have a power source in order to heat up my soup, either electricity or gas. Those are the two things that I need to heat the soup to make it just fabulous. The reason I'm showing you that is because I was thinking about that in relation to being a Christian. Sometimes being a Christian, we run around and we do all sorts of things. We come to church, we go to prayer meetings, we go to Sunday school, or we go to a Bible class, or perhaps we go to committee meetings. We do all sorts of things as Christians, but we forget about the source of the power that we have as Christians. God sent his son Jesus into the world to be our savior. And Jesus is the one that we follow. And we're going to learn later in church that Jesus is the foundation of our faith. But if we forget about Jesus, then actually we've missed the point. Just like I forgot about the gas stove or the electric cooker or the microwave. I forgot about the source of power to heat my soup. So sometimes we forget about Jesus when we're Christians and we run around doing everything in our own strength instead of looking to Jesus. Because as I said the other week, Jesus gives us someone to help us with the Christian life. Someone who fills us with power. He gives us his Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit lives in us, those who confess Jesus as their Lord. The Holy Spirit lives in us and gives us the power to do what Jesus asks us to do. That is to follow him. So, if you are at home or even here in church and you recognize that, yep, sometimes as a Christian you run about and you do all sorts of things, don't forget about Jesus, who is the foundation of our faith, who gives us the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's pray about that. Father God, we thank you that we are never on our own as Christians. We thank you that we always have your Holy Spirit in our lives to lead us and to guide us and to point us to Jesus, who is the foundation and cornerstone of our faith. Help us never to take our eyes off of Jesus. Help us always to look to him. Amen. Okay, will I tidy up? Let me have a wee look. Will I tidy up? Uh, no, I'm not going to tidy up. I'm going to do the reading first. So let's do the reading and then I will tidy up. And as I had to run back and get my microphone, I forgot to lift my Bible. So I'm going to read it from the screen. So if you could put the words up on the screen. Louise, that would be fabulous. I'll just stand here and read. So we're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 to 10. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never 
be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May God add his blessing to that reading from his holy word. Now, I, uh, I introduced many of you as you came in the door to Christopher, our, our new student, and I'm going to ask Christopher now to introduce himself. Christopher. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here, and uh, hopefully over the next 25 weeks or so, I'll get to know more of you and be able to meet each other, hopefully without face masks on the whole time. Um, as Donald said, um, I'm a first-year student uh, training uh, for full-time ministry within the Church of Scotland, and Donald said it would be nice just to take a couple of minutes this morning to introduce uh, myself to you this morning and to maybe tell you a small bit about my, my faith journey as to where I got to this point. Um, as everything needs a title when you're writing it down, I, I wrote a title which is, I Had a Plan. So I was taken to church as a small child, went to Sunday school, went to Bible class, moved into taking Sunday school, taking Bible class, and running a junior choir in the church. And it's fair to say that probably up until the age of 15, 16, my um, spiritual life was through habit. Um, you don't think about it as a child, you just do what your parents tell you, at least most of the time. Um, you, you simply do it. And so it wasn't until my late teens when I really began to explore um, this idea of having an active relationship with God. Once I left school, I was fortunate to get invited into a local Bible study group. And it was at this point that I really developed my, my relationship with God insofar as having that personal relationship, realizing that God was actively working in my life and beginning to ask questions like, what was I going to do as a Christian? What was I going to give back to God and to my church going forward? For anyone who knows me, they will know that one of my passions in life is music. Uh, Ewan in the band there has come across me uh, on a few occasions, and some of you may have been to see a Dumfries Musical Theatre Company production where likelihood is I will be behind the keys playing bum notes. Um, not long after I started um, at university, a local church called me up and said they were looking for an organist. And I said, that's fine, I'll, I'll help you out the odd Sunday. Ten years later, I left, having been a full-time organist and choir master there with them. During that period, I developed a love for worship music and for being able to lead worship through um, music, through song. And I decided at that point that that was my gift that I was going to give back to God. God had clearly given me this ability and through doing worship through music that was going to be what I was going to give back to God. I had a plan. I moved to Traqueer Church in Dumfries back in 2016 uh, when they were looking for an organist and it reduced my 120 mile commute that I used to do every Sunday morning uh, to go to my other church. I had a plan. So until two weeks ago, I was a lawyer. I was working in Dumfries. I've been a lawyer for 12 years. And when I finished my law degree, I remember saying very clearly to everyone who would listen, I am never going to sit an exam again. I am never going to study in my life again. I have had it. No more. I just wanted to work. I had a plan. My family come from Ayrshire, and I moved to Dumfries in 2009 to start working as, my, as a lawyer. I intended on working hard, principally to, to fund my desire to buy very expensive German cars. 
and I intended to settle in Dumfries. I was lucky enough to meet Erin, my fiancée here, and um, thought that we would live quite happily in Dumfries, in our house, no changes. I had a plan. But no matter how many plans I made or how many decisions I took, the reality was that this wasn't God's plan. Ever since I'd left school, I was aware of a small part of me saying that at some point in my life, I would play a bigger part in church. This grew over time till I became aware of what I would describe as a small voice speaking within me, saying that I was to go and explore ministry. I didn't know what ministry would look like uh, or when it would happen, but this feeling was clear that at some point in the future, my future was ministry, not law. Now, I tried to ignore the voice. No, 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 no. Ministry is music. That's as far as it goes. I had a plan. I had a bargain. No more studies. No more nothing. I had a plan. But that, that was my plan, and that was not God's plan. The Church of Scotland offers um, people like myself the option to enter what they call a period of discernment, where you work with a minister closely and a, an assessor from the presbytery in order to try and work out what it is you want to do. This process involves you getting a very basic understanding of the different types of ministry through prayer and reflection, working out what it is that you think God is calling you to do. I'm sure everyone here will be familiar with the story of Paul and his conversion on the road to Damascus. However, unfortunately, God does not always speak as directly with us the way he spoke with Paul. And I found myself on many occasions wishing that God could perhaps put a great big sign in the sky with flashing lights telling me what it was he wanted me to do. However, I went through the discernment process and at the end of that, I believed that God was calling me to enter um, what they call full-time ministry of word and sacrament, so to do what Donald does. I went to a national assessment conference, uh, which is where they put you through their paces, and Donald may have shared with you that he's heavily involved in that process, uh, and as he is, I'm going to refrain from speaking honestly about it. Um, however, I will say that obtaining the nuclear launch codes is perhaps more straightforward. And after all of that, you get to where I am now. A first year university student in my first placement with a new congregation, not knowing where this journey will end or what it will look like. Not my plan, but God's plan. And I am so excited to be doing it. I really look forward to getting to know all of you over the coming weeks. And if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to um, pin me down in the corridor so far as regulations allow. It'll be lovely to speak to you. Thank you. Christopher, um, and so yeah, please do feel free to ask uh, Christopher anything at all really about you know um, what he's doing and uh, and how he's getting on. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that every time we have a student, you'll find uh, folks are very supportive. Um, and I just would want to point out one thing to you there. You said you're going to be doing what I do. For goodness sake, don't do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, everyone agrees. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a joy to have you, and uh, we do look forward to you being here in a very strange time. Uh, Christopher's experience will be a bit different from the normal experience of a student uh, and it will probably change from time to time depending on uh, how the regulations change. But uh, we'll work our way through all of that. We're going to enter our quiet time now. Um, so taking you know, the reading that we've just heard uh, from First Peter, um, taking what Christopher has just shared about his journey, taking your cares and concerns um, into account, let's just pause and move towards our quiet time, that short time of reflective silence, to bring to God anything we want to bring to God. And let's remain seated um, as we hear, open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus.
we read in Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be worried about anything, but in all your prayers, ask God for what you need, always asking him with a thankful heart. And God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with Christ Jesus. Trusting then that God listens and answers our prayers, we bring our prayers of session to him, intercession to him now. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, how lucky we are to have a God who listens to all our worries and cares. How lucky we are that you know those things that are on our hearts before we even mention them. We thank you that we are able to come now in this time and bring those things that are concerning us, trusting that you will deal with these situations in the way that only you can. Father God, you give us so much and in, by way of small token in return, this morning we have brought our money, our time and our talents and we ask the, you to dedicate these now to your glory and to the glory of the wider church. Father, we think firstly this morning about our families and friends, those who may be going through a change in job, adapting to being back at school, struggling with the changes brought about as a result of the pandemic, those who are ill. And in a moment of silence, Father, we name those people who are closest to us before you now. We think of our country and how we are still grappling with this disease that is plaguing our land. Father, we ask that you give wisdom to our politicians, that they would make decisions to ensure the safety of everyone. We thank you for all those people who have placed themselves in harm's way to help those who are sick and for those who have given their lives in that service. We would ask you, Lord, to be with the families of those who have lost loved ones and give them your comfort and peace as they grieve. Again, Lord, we pause and name those people and situations that are closest to us now. Lord, we pray this morning for our world and the devastating forest fires that have been in America. We pray for all those made homeless and who have died as a result of Storm Sally. We pray this morning for all those countries where political unrest and violence are a daily occurrence. We ask, Lord, that you will bring peace to these areas of your world and that all would feel your presence. Finally, Lord, we ask this morning that you look into our hearts and minds and that you take those private concerns that we have and answer them. And in a final moment, Lord, we pause and name those before you now. O oh Lord, who hears our cries, our joys, our sadness, and our happiness. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. This morning I want to ask you, what is a Christian? If I were to ask you to explain what a Christian is, I wonder what you would say. Many people have a rather naive understanding of what a Christian is. Many think, for example, that Christianity is about being good. Are you good? You don't have to answer that. Others think that it's about going to church and singing hymns. Or I suppose today, logging in to church and really singing hymns at home. Some think it's a rather complicated thing with 
lots of rituals to follow because they see different traditions, uh, perhaps on television. When it comes to faith, God, religion, there are many competing voices in the world, many different viewpoints and perspectives, which result in people being confused as to who God is and what Christianity is. Many think it's a moral code, a way of behaving, and if, that if they are good, then they are Christian. But Christianity is so much more than a moral code, so much more than a way of behaving. A Christian has decided to build his or her life on Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of Christian faith. Without Jesus, there is no Christian faith. Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation of the life of the Christian. And just like any building has to be built on a solid foundation or cornerstone, so our Christian lives are built on that solid foundation of Jesus. Writing to the Corinthians about Christian faith, the Apostle Paul pointed out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 at verse 11 that God has already placed Jesus Christ as the one and only foundation and no other foundation can be laid. Jesus is the foundation of Christian faith. The cornerstone, as we heard Peter call him in our reading today from 1 Peter chapter 2. Quoting first of all from the book of the prophet Isaiah, at Isaiah 28 verse 16, Peter writes, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And then, quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22, Peter writes, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And so Peter refers to Jesus as the cornerstone of faith. And in the passage that we read, he tells us that this cornerstone can do what others cannot do. He is a gift that is valuable to God. He transforms us into living stones. And on these living stones, he will build faith. If we believe in him, Peter tells us, we will never be disappointed. All of that is contained between verse 4 and verse 7 of the passage that I read earlier. And Peter goes on to say that those who believe in Jesus will value this gift as a precious possession. Like a rock, he gives stability. He is alive and participates in life with us. He makes something valuable out of us. And so Peter is in no doubt Jesus is the cornerstone on whom our Christian faith is built. But then he goes on to tell us in the second half of verse 7 and verse 8 that not everyone appreciates this gift of Jesus, this cornerstone as he calls him. For there are those who do not believe, those who do not recognize who Jesus is, and so they stumble over him. They do not recognize who he is and the fact that he is the cornerstone of faith and life. Back in the pioneering days of the United States when the Old West, I guess the Wild West, was being settled, there were a lot of pioneers who made their way over the Oregon Trail. And such journeys are immortalized in the old epic westerns that used to be so popular in cinemas and on the television when I was a lad. And the story goes that when the pioneers got to the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains, they found a small river, which was just a wee bit too wide to cross in one step. And so they two-stepped across by using a heavy lump of stone sticking out of the water in the middle of the stream. Over the years, more and more people made the journey to claim the land. People settled, built their cabins, strung fences, plowed and irrigated the fields. But one pioneer decided not to go too far into the Rocky Mountains. And so he built a cabin 
on the banks of the small river with the heavy lump of stone sticking up in the middle. But after a while, he discovered a problem. He'd chosen a rather windy spot and often his door would flap and bang in the wind. So to solve his problem, he took the heavy lump of stone from the middle of the stream, carried it to his front step and used it as a doorstop. More years passed and succeeding generations developed the West and continued on the Oregon Trail. Modern cities eventually started to spring up. An nephew of the old pioneer who was at university studying geology went to visit his uncle during the holidays. And what did he discover on the front porch of his uncle's cabin by the river? This heavy lump of stone, which he discovered when he tripped over it. The stone that had been taken from the river and used as a doorstop. But because the nephew was a geology student, he recognized something that no one else had seen. This was not just a doorstop, not just a heavy lump of stone, but it was actually a lump of gold. In fact, it was the largest gold nugget ever discovered on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. At least, so the story goes. It had been there for at least three generations, but everyone saw it in a different light. Some was a heavy lump of stone on which to step, some as a doorstop, but only the nephew saw it for what it really was, a precious stone full of gold. In a way, the same thing is true of Jesus. This is what Peter is trying to tell us. The one that Christians see as the cornerstone of faith and life, others have seen as a rock to stumble over. As Peter writes, quoting Isaiah again, chapter 8, verse 14, he, sa- he writes, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall was actually a very precious stone. For the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. As the foundation of any building is the most important part, as the cornerstone is actually the most important important stone of all and in fact my talk to the children I was telling Christopher wasn't the one I was going to do what I was going to do was build a Jenga tower and pull out the corner one and you would see that it would fall over problem was I couldn't find the Jenga this morning I should, should have prepared that a bit earlier you would see that the corner stone even in your mind you can see that a Jenga tower with a corner stone you pull the corner stone out and the whole edifice crumbles the whole tower crumbles The cornerstone is the most important stone of all. And so the foundation and cornerstone of faith is most important of all. And that is why a Christian has decided to build his or her life on Jesus. The cornerstone of Christian faith. Christianity is more than being good. It is more than a moral code. It is about building your life on Jesus. If we continue with this passage that Peter has handed down to us, we discover that this cornerstone, Jesus, brings us into God's new covenant. Peter uses old covenant imagery in this passage. He talks of, in verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Before Jesus came, the people of Israel were God's chosen people. The Old Testament tells us the story of the nation of Israel with all of its ups and downs as the people struggled to break free of slavery and set up their own nation. The story of Israel is set in the context of a covenant with God where they were his people and he was their God. But now Jesus, the cornerstone of faith, comes with a new covenant where Gentiles are included with believing Israelites. Now all who believe in Jesus, all who build their lives on the cornerstone, are included in this new covenant. Now, says Peter, we are God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You see, we are God's chosen people called to proclaim the wonderful acts of God. We are part of the new covenant in Christ. A wee girl dressed in her Sunday best was running as fast as she could trying to get to Bible class and not be late. And as she ran, she prayed, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. And while she was running and praying, she tripped and fell, getting her clothes dirty and tearing her dress. And so she got up, brushed herself off, and started running again. And as she ran, she began to pray again, saying, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late, but please don't shove me either. Well, perhaps we do need a shove sometimes. For in our modern world, there is a danger that we as Christians lose sight of who we are. A danger that the secular context in which we live these days dilutes the call of God to follow Jesus. Dilutes the message that Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. Dilutes the message that we are part of God's new covenant in Christ. Perhaps if we forget who we are, then we start to build our lives on money and possessions rather than on Jesus, the cornerstone of faith. That life becomes an end in itself rather than what it was meant for, to live in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So perhaps sometimes we need a shove from God every now and then just to remind us who we are. We are God's chosen people, called to proclaim the wonderful acts of God. The wonderful acts of God are summed up in Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of our faith, the one on whom the Christian has decided to build his or her life. So let me just ask you, on what do you build your life? On the standards of secular society? on your emotions and feelings, on the material world that you inhabit? Or do you build your life on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, the very cornerstone of faith and life? Let us pray. Lord, help us when we are tempted to do things in our own strength, to remember that we have built our life upon Jesus that he is the cornerstone of our faith. Help us each day to turn to him, to renew our hope and trust in him, and to continue to build upon the foundation that he laid in our lives when he called us into his new covenant, when he found us and saved us and gave us this gift of faith. Lord, be with us and help us to continue to build upon our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs> What's next? I'm not happy. I think I've lost my order of service. Hold on a wee second. It's probably hidden amongst these sermon notes somewhere. Oh, here it is. Right. We're going to not sing our final praise item, but if you're at home and you're watching this, I would encourage you to sing as loud as you possibly can. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
Let us all stand for the blessing. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us now and always. Amen. Please be seated. And can I remind you just, if you're here in church, can I remind you just to remain seated until it's your turn to to leave.